you have to turn around. Oh, no. No. <laughs> what happens when you work together for a long time? There we go. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me today. I got to spend a lot of time here this weekend for the Florida Network Gathering, uh, and I was so blessed by your hospitality. You really know what it is like to open your space and to open people to be received here. Um, and so thank you so much for that. Uh, it was wonderful to get to know many of you, and I'm looking forward to seeing you all today after worship as well. And I'm just grateful for this invitation to be able to stay a little bit longer in Florida. I used to live in St. Pete, and now I live in uh, Washington, D.C., so it felt very much like a homecoming to be able to see so many folks be back in the humidity. My hair really missed it, as probably too. <laughs> so will you pray with me? Loving God, we thank you for this space. We thank you for this holy ground where we can ask deep questions of you and of one another. God, guide us as we look for you and we seek you today. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. In your presence, we pray. Amen. So as I understand it, y'all are getting done with a sermon series on fishtails, right? Came to the right church at the right time, so that's good. Um, the passage that we had today, I think, is perfect for today in a world where we are definitely in the midst of chaos, where we lit 11 candles honoring lives that were taken from senseless violence. I think this passage that we have gives us a lot of hope, and it gives us a lot of questions, and it gives us a lot of challenge for ways that we are called to live our lives today. It is believed that Mark wrote the Gospel, the Gospel of Mark, or an author, whoever that might be, maybe it was Mark, maybe it wasn't, anyway, wrote this Gospel for a community that was in the midst of war. Um, if you read Mark, especially in comparison to other Gospels, it's shorter, and it seems like he goes from one thing to another to another, and you're kind of on this really epic journey of Jesus' life, I think. And when I read Mark, I often think of the author sitting in the corner of a dark room with a candle lit and writing as fast as he could to capture this hope in the midst of chaos that was around in the midst of war in the city where he lived. And I just think of this incredible hope and in how someone took the time in the midst of so much despair to give us these words today and to give us so many stories of power throughout this whole gospel. And according to Mark, Jesus began his public ministry by saying, now is the time for fulfillment. The kingdom of God is at hand right and I think sometimes it's hard to feel that, isn't it? Especially days like today. And in a country where we live, where there's so much division. But we are constantly called to work to bring together the kingdom of God so that it can be fulfilled right now. And for many of us, we have glimpses of hope that we've already experienced, haven't we? And we just finished celebrating the 50th anniversary of NCC. For many people, before MCC existed, we couldn't gather in a space like this as a queer community. But now we can, and we can celebrate God who invites all of us to the table week after week to partake in the gifts that God has given us. That is hope. That is the kingdom coming together right now to be fulfilled. And hopefully that hope will have us go and reach out to other communities. In today's passage, we meet Jesus and his disciples as they were going across the sea to Galilee. And I heard last week you talked a little bit about that and about that journey of coming into discipleship. And we meet Jesus. I love the version that was read today, just as he was. And they had just come from uh, preaching and teaching, and Jesus was preaching to hundreds and thousands of people who were gathering to hear what he was saying. And he must have been tired. <laughs> So he gets on this boat, and he falls asleep. And then this storm comes, we read, and the storm comes, and the disciples who were fishermen, if you remember from last week, so they were familiar with these waters. They had spent 
so much time gathering fish and spending time on this water, navigating the shores, that if this storm was so bad, they felt like they had to wake up Jesus. It must have been really bad, right? And so they're terrified, and they wake up Jesus and say, where are you? You're asleep. We are going to die. We're going to be at the bottom of this lake, and here you are just asleep. And Jesus just says, peace, be still to the waters, and they calm down. And then he says to the disciples, where is your faith? I have come here, and I have said that the world will be different because I am here, and you're my disciples, and we are in this together. And here you are, and you have no faith, even over this storm. And I think oftentimes it feels like that for us, right? Where is our faith sometimes in the middle of violence? But the answer is in the text. The answer is in the community of people who are there. The answer is in the ability for the disciples to hear Jesus' call and to continue it forward even after he's gone. The hope is in our very bodies that we can carry forth this message of hope. Yesterday, while we were in this room, is when we found out the news of the massacre at the synagogue. And as the day unfolded, so did the news, and we found out that 11 people were murdered and six wounded. And chaos was all around when the synagogue was meeting in order to find peace that day. I read one news report that says that there was a christening of a newborn baby. And all of these people were gathered in community like we're all gathered to, to be, to support one another in times of beauty, in times of grace, and in times of tragedy. And their peace was stolen from them. But hope was there. Someone must have called someone to get help. Someone definitely helped others get out of the building. People risked their own lives to come into the synagogue to save those that they could. Even though I think it's hard to see hope in that situation, it's there. It's in the way that the community cared for each other that night. Instead of going home and just doing whatever, they came together in a vigil, surrounded and supported by the community around them, who said, we're here and we care for you. You are our beloved. And even though we might pray to different gods or pray in a different way or maybe not even pray at all, we're all here together against violence. And that is what we're called to do, isn't it? There is great hope with God, even when it's hard to see in the midst of everyday life. As a faithful people, we're also called to ask God, where are you when we don't feel God's presence? In that moment, I feel like there must have been so many questions. Where are you? Instead of doing other things on this Saturday, we are here praising you, but where are you? You can't even be bothered to keep us from harm. What kind of God are you? These are the questions we have to ask of God, even though they're hard, and they rub up against some of the ways that we commonly go about life. We probably all have experiences of things where we said, God, where are you? Where are you in the midst of this oppression, in the midst of this degradation? Where are you? And hopefully we can see glimmers of where God shows up, and it's not in the violence. God is always in the actions of love. I don't know why violent things happen. I don't think any of us. We have theories probably of what brings someone to violence, and we have understandings of where people might come when they turn to violent acts or oppressive acts. But it's not from God. I don't know why those things are allowed to happen, but they are. But I do know that we are offered the tools to be able to give to others the love that we receive from others and we need from them, right? We can offer love to other people when they're in the midst of whatever violence they've experienced in word or in deed. That is what we're called to do. And when, G when Mark, in, in this account, has Jesus saying, have you no faith? I think he is calling us into action. I don't really think that he's challenging the disciples and saying, oh, you shouldn't question me or God. You shouldn't question what goes on in the world. 
I think Jesus is saying, have enough faith that you have the tools to be able to bring about peace, even in this chaotic world. Have you no faith that I have equipped you with what you need in order to restore peace and to bring the kingdom here on earth? Have you no faith that I will always be with you? When you are hurt, I will be hurt. When you suffer, I will suffer. I will forever remain with you. That is our covenant. Have you no faith that I will always be here? You will not be spared from loneliness. You will not be spared from depression. You will not be spared from oppression. But I will be here anyway. Have you no faith? Yesterday, as vigil, vigils and solidarity of the Jewish people arose, a Presbyterian minister wrote a really beautiful hymn that I want to share with you today. And she is a, a person who's written many, many hymns, often in the, in the um, after aftermath of tragedy or the aftermath of celebration. And so I think this hymn is just a beautiful reminder of who God is and a way to carry our grief. So I'm not going to sing it for you, but I will lead you the way. You can close your eyes if you want or open your eyes or receive this however you would like to. Oh God, this day we grieve your children who are lost. And we, as one, are horrified by hatred caused. For people loved by you, your children, called and blessed, were murdered on their Sabbath day of prayer and rest. We grieve for those who died, for families left behind, for those who wonder if this world can still be kind. So many lives were changed, so many dreams were crushed. There's so much hatred. God, what has become of us? We thank you, God, for ones who bravely entered in to serve and to protect so hatred would not win. And for those, the ones who lead, we offer you this prayer. May they be good examples of respect and care. God, teach us all to love and may we understand that hatred cannot have a place in this sacred land, and guns cannot secure the peace we pray will be. May we together build a true community. O oh God, unite us all, no matter how we pray, and may we work together for a better day, where all may live in safety and have no cause for fear. May we together seek your peace and justice. Amen. Amen. I, I think this, these lyrics really offer us hope and challenge and ask the question, where are you, God? And also offer a response of, we are here and we will work for your peace. And I think, you know, this, this text today didn't come from the lectionary. It came from the sermon series, but I think it could speak better to our situation. <coughs> And I think the work of discipleship indeed bonds us together toward love and bonds us together in the face of any sort of violence that keeps us from peace. And so as I close, I want to offer you a few things that I think this text can give us as we go forward. Some three points of discipleship for us to remember, to, uh, to take with us as we go forward in this path of discipleship which is indeed full of all sorts of beautiful and difficult and wonderful things that we could never expect or know to, or, or be able to, to envision when we walk into this path. We don't know what's in store at the end. We don't know what's in store even around the block. But it's a path that we get to go on with God and enter into God's story. So first, discipleship calls us out of comfort. I'm seeing some head nods here, right? Discipleship indeed doesn't ask us to stay seated in our comfortable places and to say, oh, isn't this nice? We finally have the thing that we budgeted for or the thing that we fundraised for. Now we don't have to work anymore. Oh, we fought for marriage equality. Now we can sit here and enjoy marriage. That's great. <laughs> indeed, we have things that we must always work for. 
We see violence in our communities and we ought to be mad. We ought to be angry and sad and do something with that. We should always celebrate the victories that we've been a part of and celebrate them big, have big parties like General Conference to celebrate 50 years. But we shouldn't let that be the end. God is still working in our midst and God has big plans for us as long as we step in and say, okay, I'm willing to get out of this comfortable seat. The second thing that we can learn from this story and be reminded of in our walk in discipleship is that discipleship will leave us awe-inspired. There will be moments when we just don't have the words. I've been a part of many vigils in the past. I don't know if anybody else has in this room. Um, but being a part of a vigil and being a part of a place where everyone is just there to be in solidarity and to stand or sit or be amongst other people is so amazing. And it can just be this moment where you know that God is present in, even in the midst of anything else that's happening. Um, one time I was at Creating Change, which is an LGBT advocacy conference. And we were doing a ritual there. Um, there had been another shooting of it during the time that we were together at the conference. And so we decided to have a healing service. And we didn't really have anything because we came to the conference not expecting to see something like this. So, you know, some people had a candle that they travel with. One person had some, some rose water, you know, the lightly scented water. Um, some people had uh, oil, we had all sorts of stuff. So we decided to collect it all and put it on a table. And so we had this healing service and we just said, oh, if anybody wants to come for healing, you can come for healing. We had no idea who would show up. We thought mostly it'd be the other faith leaders at the conference who usually come to that sort of thing. But the room was full. All sorts of people wanted to find healing. And it wasn't just around what the current events were. So people were looking for healing of all sorts. And this conference is mostly young folks, so mostly people um, under 30 at that conference, a lot of them even in high school, many of them are not churched. That's why usually only the religious leaders come to the religious things. Um, but this was this incredible opportunity for anyone to come and receive healing. And I was leading one of the stations where we were blessing people and it was kind of funny because I'm used to being in a religious circle, so at first I was blessing people with a cross, and then I realized that's really not that accessible, so then I started blessing people with an equal sign. Um, and so as I was blessing people, I asked folks, what did they want healing for? And so many people said, I want to be rid of shame, I want to be rid of guilt, I want to let go of these burdens that I've been carrying. And I, had, I just had no idea what God was doing in the midst of that for those people. And for all of us who got to be a part of that healing journey and receive healing ourselves. And I left that room and I was just stunned. I had no idea that they would turn out to be so full of grace and so full of love. And it was all from a few things that we could carry in our suitcases just in case we needed something or wanted to do something. So discipleship will always leave us awe-inspired. Maybe it's finding love. Maybe it's finding forgiveness. Maybe it's letting go of shame or guilt. In so many ways, we're left just speechless. In discipleship, we also find endless love and are invited to give endless love. And this isn't the easy kind of love that you might see on a little sweet Valentine card. This is the kind of love that calls us into action. It's the kind of love that forgives even the most atrocious of things. It's the kind of love that says, I love you even though you've hurt me. It's the kind of love that calls us to be present even when we don't want to be. And it's the kind of love that just is there. The kind of love that shows up even when we don't know what to say or what to do or how to act. The kind of love that is present and always offers itself. 
I'm so grateful to be able to receive this kind of love all the time from communities like this that open your doors for gatherings and for all sorts of other things. Um, and actually yesterday was the anniversary of my mom's death. She died two years ago. So those flowers someone sent me and I thought they would be a better gift for this community this morning. And uh, my mom and I had a very rough relationship. She was pretty verbally abusive when I was growing up and some other things. And um, we just didn't have the best relationship. And um, the week before she died, a friend of mine said, it's never too late to ask for forgiveness or offer it. And so as my mom laid there, my dad and I both went up. And we did this thing that someone taught when you say to the person, to the person I love you. And I forgive you, and I hope you'll forgive me. And obviously you can put in whatever words you want to to expound upon that. And so I got to do that with my mom, and my dad got to do that with my mom. And it was the most holy, loving moment I could have ever imagined. And so now when I think about my mom, and when I honor her, I think about those moments and that love that we share, <coughs> even though so much hurt is between us. We were able to let it go. And even if someone that you hold a resentment for is no longer with us here, we can always do that work of love. It's never too late. So discipleship is no easy task, is it? It calls us to really see inside of ourselves and to be present for others who are hurting, but it is such a beautiful gift, isn't it? I wouldn't want to give it away for anything in the world. To be able to be with people in a community and work and strive for peace, to say to the turbulent waters, peace, be calm, is such a gift. It's hard work, but we can do it together. And we might not know the weather forecast. I needed to get that sermon title in there somewhere. <laughs> but <laughs> we can jump onto the boat even if the waters are murky and turbulent, and know that God is with us, and we can support one another along the journey. I'm going to close in this prayer that um, Mother Teresa prayed every morning. Uh, she prayed for us individually, but I'm going to pray for us as a body. And it's my favorite prayer, um, so will you pray with me? Dear Jesus, help us spread thy fragrance wherever we go. Flood our soul with thy spirit and love. Penetrate and possess our whole being so utterly that all our lives may be a radiance of thine. Shine through us and be so in us that every soul we come in contact with may feel thy presence in our souls. Let them look up and see no longer us, but only you. Stay with us, and then we shall begin to shine as you shine, so to shine and to be a light to others. Amen.